Blog Talk Radio. The Chamo Afura Kanu Afura Kanu Tene Ye Akanfo Nana Som Da Medinde Ojirapo Kwesi Ra Nam Pata Akan Akwamo Maya Maruka Tipimo Ojirapo means greetings to all Afura Kani Afura Kaini people, meaning Africans, black people. Today is Akanfo Nana Som Day, ancient, authentic Akan ancestral religion. My name is Ojirapo Kwesi Rod Nahembata Akan, Ojirapo of the Akwamu Nation in North America. Yerase, we appreciate you. Thank you for tuning in once again to our show. We're going to put up a couple of links before we get started. And in the meantime, the first one, actually we're going to put up this link to the Nhoma page on our website. And when you go to that on my page, you can um, download, and I'll put the link to that as well, download the Ubin Shang and the Kuku Tun Tun from that page. That's, you, you can download the, the uh, PDF versions of those two books. We're going to get into some information in those books. Um, and then let, let me also put a link up to one of the um, translations of the text dealing with a top from the Shabaka stone. Here's one particular link we just put up. A misnomer of the Memphite theology, often it's called. And then I'll put up another one as well. So if you have a, you know, a different um, reference for it as well, because we're going to be going into detail about that. Okay, so I posted the first one, and here's the second one. Okay, hold on one second. So um, when people, um, when you're looking at these transliterations, of course, it's always best to, um, for example, get, get a text. For example, the text by Ankh Mi Ra, Let the Ancestors Speak, which is a a language course in learning the Medut and Toro, the so called Medut Nature or the writings of the divinities. Um the language of ancient Kemet, the Medut to the hieroglyphic writing. Brother wrote a book, Let the Ancestors Speak. Um Ankh Mi Ra, Ankh A N K H Mi M I Ra, R-A, I know sometimes it's hard to get. I think I've seen somebody posted a PDF version, electronic version on scribe.com or something like that. Um, But there are other texts as well. But learning to study, you begin to learn to read the Medutu, and then also um, learning one of our contemporary languages. That's key because the way we learn how to vocalize the terms from our ancient language is through the living languages of today, whether it's Akan, Yoruba, various languages, various Bantu languages. We still have the same words with proper vocalization because sometimes the vowels weren't written in Kemet, sometimes they were. It's not true that there were no vowels written in Kemet. That's not accurate. There are many symbols that represent the various vowel sounds in reality, even though some people try to say it's not. But it's clear, and we can prove that through the vocalization, the way we vocalize these terms in um, our contemporary languages today, since they're directly derivative, the same symbols show up in the same places where we use these the same vowel sounds for the exact same symbol. So we, we know how to pronounce these terms. For example, the term amen in Akan, of course, you'll find that as Amen in ancient Kemet. So sometimes they'll stick an O in there. Sometimes they'll stick a U in there because of the way it was pronounced by the Greeks or in, in the late period. But we still pronounce the name Amen in Akan culture. It's still, it was Amen in ancient Kemet. And you can see um, the same symbol for the reed, which represents the letter A, that A sound. It can also be an A sound, a short A, S sound, but also an A. Um, you'll find that symbol, and then when you look through various words that have that symbol, 
representing that vowel sound, and then you look at those same words in the Akan language, what you'll find is that the vowel A is in the same position. So there are vowels in the language of ancient Kemet, of course, all of them. Um, sometimes they weren't written, sometimes they were. So um, when you're using the language, the contemporary languages, you can get that information. All right, so I just want to send out a couple of notifications as we're getting, you know, getting that information together. Um, real quick, sorry we were running a couple of minutes late. If you have any questions, of course, you can, about any of the other material as well, questions you may have wanted to ask um, in the past, you can also, you know, you can, of course, hit the number one if you're on the phone um, so we can see that your hand is raised. And also, it, um, you must sign in to the, as a user with your username into Blog Talk in order to interact in the chat room. So you can do that. You can post your questions at any time. Um, we will be, of course, broadcasting tomorrow, Tuesday, Benada, Abenada, which is Ojirada, and we will be having a good show tomorrow. Of course, Wednesday, Awukuda, Akuada is Egua Marketplace Day, where we showcase products and services from our people in the community who are serving the community various organizations, products, services, businesses, and so forth, but also share our ancestral values at the same time. So that will be coming up. So that's every week, 9 p.m. Eastern um, on, the, on the same channel. I just want to send out this last message real quick. So let the people know that we're on. We didn't get a chance to send out one of the mass emails earlier today. And okay, that'd be that'd be that. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to get into um, the text. We're going to get into the Shabaka text. So we're talking about this is part of our series dealing with these various creative abosom, these creative divinities, these deities, as called in the Akan tradition, the abosom, plural obosom, obosom is singular, abosom is plural, forces in nature, the spirits that animate the suns, moons, stars, oceans, black substance of space, fire, thunder, lightning, and so forth, the various aspects of the created universe, the spirits of, that govern these aspects are the abosom, as they are called in the Akan tradition. And they have different um, descriptive titles as well. Of course, in the Yoruba tradition, they're called the Orisha. In the Fon and Ebe tradition, they're called the Vodun. In ancient Kemet, the typical title for them is Ntoru, Ntorotu, Misnomer, Neteru, Netutu. Um, of course, in Akan, Ntoro, meaning deity, exists as Ntoro, meaning divinity, Ntorot, the female divinity goddess in ancient Kemet, Ntoro, or Ntong in Akan culture, still talking about it. Divinity inherited through the matric clan, the Ntoro deity inherited through the patric clan. So on both sides, male and female, the father side and the mother side, we inherit the abosom through our blood circle. So we still use the same terms in Akan to designate the forces in nature. The term abosom, of course, comes from Bosum and Echikamet, the offspring of the great mother and the great father. Nyamewa, uh, Nyamewa, Amenet, Amen, and we still use the term Bosun, talking about the deities, the children of the supreme being. So um, we're dealing with these specific group of divinities. Um, we talk about Nyamewa, Nyame, Amenet, Amen in, in ancient Kemet, Nyamewa, Nyame in the Akan culture. Of course, we had the show going into detail talking about showing that Nyame is just the form Adi Amen from ancient Kemet, which is the title of Amen. Adi Amen became Adi Amen, Oniyame, Oniyame in Akan, and Oniyambe in Losi, and Onjambe in the Herero tradition, and Nzambi in um, Bakango. And across the continent, you'll find variations of the name Amen or Aniyame across the board. The same deity and then the great mother, 
Anayamewa, which is Amenet or Amenat from ancient Kemet and ancient Kanit, Nubia, um, same divinity. So the children of the, of the great mother and the great father, the organs within the great divine body of the supreme being are the abosom. The class of creative abosom, we're talking about, we talked about Nyonkompon and Nyonkompon, who are the creator and creatress of the universe, called Ra and Ra'et in ancient Kemet. We showed how the title Ra Aku, Ra Ku, became Da Ku or Nan Ku, and Nan Ku Pong, Pong meaning great, also circular. Nan Ku Pong or Nyon Ku Pong means the great Pong. Nan Ku or Ra Ku is really Ra Aku, the great Ra Aku, title from ancient Kemet, and he takes the form of a serpent, just like in ancient Kemet, the serpent, the circular serpent, is symbol of Ra. The circular serpent is a symbol of Ra'at. He's Ra'aku um, as a circular serpent. In, a, in our Khan culture, Ra'aku becomes Da'aku, Nanku, Nyanku, and Pong means great. So the great Pong, circular serpent, Nanku Pong, and Yonku Pong is still talking about Ra'aku, the great Ra'aku. The same thing with Ra'at, Aku. In Yonku Pong and Yonku Tong, the rainbow serpent, creator and creatress of the universe, who are grandchildren of Nyame Wa, Nyame Amenet. I mean, the great father and the great mother. And we make that distinction to show, we always make that clarification. The supreme being, Inyamewa and Inyame, give birth to and their grandchildren, which is Ra and Ra'et, who go out, who they direct to go out and create the universe. Just like you as a being have the capacity to direct your energy through your reproductive organs to go out and create a child. You're the being, and you're directing your life force energy. I'm in and I'm in that. Nyamewa direct Ra and Ra'at to go out and create the world. So that's a clear distinction. Um, and Nyokompon and Nyokoton and Akan, we talked about them. We talked about Odomankuma, and we talked about Tredriampong last week. Odomankuma is Atumukopa in ancient Kemet, Atem Kepra, Atumukopa. Doman Koma and Akan, um, another title, that, so that's Atem or Atum. And then you have Tredrian Pong. We showed and clearly proved um, clearly that Tredrian Pong is a title of Kepra in ancient Kemet. Kepra is also called Kerer, Ra, Kerer, talking about the scarab beetle. And Cherer um, in Akan is a form of a beetle. It's talking about the beetle, Chere, who drags or pulls Tre, Chere, the Oriya, the sun, the so Tre Driampong is the great beetle pulling the sun or pushing the sun. And of course, when you see the great beetle, Kepra in ancient Kemet or Kere in ancient Kemet, he's pulling or pushing the sun across the sky. So we went into detail about that and what their functions are. Um, Tre Driampong with Kepra being the explosive power of the sun operating through the sunrise and so forth. Atem or Odomankoma being the um, burning, consuming fire that brings it into the day, the setting sun, concretization, um, hard, compact substance. Tem, finisher, Tem, complete one, Tem, he completes the process. Um, Kepra begins the process. Atem completes the process. Keprit, the female divinity. Scarab divinity begins the process, and Atemet, or Afaset, Nebet Hetepet, and Nebet also um, complete the process. So we went into detail about that. We showed that our, our book, Odomankoma, Tridrian Pong, Atem Kopa, Atem Kepra, and Kepra, we, we released that book a few weeks ago in soft cover, and it goes into detail about that, so we examined that. The week before, when we talked about Inyonkompon and Inyonkompon, Ra and Ra'et, we also released that book as well. We were examining that book in that particular broadcast. Um, that book is available in soft cover as well. This week, um, we're dealing with Oboadie, which is the Akan term for the divinity that fashions the created universe and fashions the male creative force that fashions the various divinities. And... Um, the sun, moon, stars, black substance of space, the bodies of our people, 
fan life, animal life, mineral life, um, and so forth. He's the fashioner of the universe and fashioner of forms. This is Boisdier in the Akan tradition. He's called Pata in ancient Kemet and Kani. He's called um, Obaluae in the Yoruba tradition. He's called Sakpata, one of the Sakpata twins. There's a male and female Sakpata twin. Um, the male Sakpata twin, of course, is um, Papa. He's also called Omolu in the Vodun tradition, but Sakpata female twin is Nyokwe Ananu, which is actually Sachima Sekhmet. So, um, so that's for that perspective, so people can understand these are the same divinity. Um, he's a functionary of Ra and Ra'et. He's subordinate to Ra and Ra'et, who is also subordinate to Amen and Amenet, or Inyame and Inyamewa. So there's a hierarchy, Inyamewa, Inyamewa. Um, Amenet, Amen, the Supreme Being, Ra and Ra'et, or Nyokumpon, Nyokumpon, you have Otomankoma, Fidriampon, but then you have Oboadie. Oboadie is after Ra and Ra'et, Pata is after Ra and Ra'et, and then subordinate to Pata is Udumakuma and Tridurampong or Akem and Kepra. So we get into that. We want to make those distinctions because, again, the whites and their offspring put forth the false notion that we engaged in monotheism. Some of the so-called Egyptologists started trying to force that idea that Akhenaten dealt with monotheism Monotheism is the highest level of spiritual development when in actuality it's, it's idiocy and none of our people were ignorant enough to embrace the foolish notion of monotheism. We know who the deities are. We know who the gods are. We know who the goddesses are. We can communicate with them. The whites and their offspring cannot. They are incapable racially and spiritually of communicating with the actual forces in nature or the spring being, so they have to manufacture in their own minds a fake deity and make themselves a representative of that fake deity to try to corrupt the religion and make us follow them and worship them and reject the real divinities because when we embrace the real forces in nature, we will execute our enemies, the whites and our offspring, and they will no longer be able to control our people. And that's key to everything that's going on right now. If we don't embrace our culture and our way of life and then structure our thoughts, intentions, and actions based on that culture, which is divine order, the acceptance of law, and the rejection, the hatred of disorder and its purveyor. So we incorporate those things. We need to harmonize our thoughts, intentions, and actions with order, and we destroy, reject, and destroy those things and individuals and entities who would otherwise place us in, in imbalance and out of balance with order. So when we embrace our culture and ancestral religion animates the culture, then we recognize who we should connect with, and who we should exterminate, who we should reject, who we should accept. We accept our own people only, those of our people in harmony with order and are striving to do that. non afurakanu non afurakaitu non-black people, the spirits of disorder, of course, we don't embrace any of them at any time for any reason ever. So when we embrace our culture, we understand that. Just like your body rejects cancer cells consistently without compromise, we reject the cancer cells in the body of black humanity, which is the non afurakani non afurakani population, and that small percentage of our population who will wage war against our own people. They become our enemies as well. So when we, when we do that, we stay in harmony with order. The whites and offspring don't want us to embrace our culture because then we will embrace our religion, and that will be the end of their control, will be the end of their control over our people. So they do everything they can. They don't care what we do. They don't care if we get involved in politics. They don't care if we get involved in um, engineering or any other endeavor. As long as they control the religion, their fake religion, and force that on us, they're not worried about anything else we're doing because they know we will never unite to the capacity that we need to. And we don't need everybody to unite. We can have a very small percentage of people who are moving in the right direction. Everybody else will come along later. But we don't need to unite all of our people in order to overthrow our enemy. A very small percentage can get that done. Just like you don't need all the cells in your body to be immune system cells, that's less than 10% of the system, the organ systems in your body that wage war. As long as that system is working, 
then everything else will get, you know, fall into place. So White and Arrow Spring understand that we, when we embrace our re- ancestral culture, that means we embrace our ancestral religion. That's the end of their control over the minds of our people and the behaviors of our people. So they don't care about anything else we're engaged in as long as they can keep their foot on that fake religion and forcing that on us, then they feel like they're in control. That's why re-establishing um, ancestral culture and religion first is the first step towards real um, ancestral nation building, revolution, and resolution. Um, so let's get into this text. We, we talked about um, Oboade, his, you know, his expression in the different cultures. We're going to talk about him cosmologically, um, who Pata is, who Abuade is cosmologically. Then we're going to get into his specific function, his, his provenance, how he comes into being, and then his specific functioning in creation. It's the, the name in our Khan culture, Abba, Adie, Ba, means, it means a number of things. It means to, to strike, to create, to make, and so forth. It comes from that force, that, that sound that's made when that energy moves through creation. So ba is a, a striking sound, a powerful sound, something that's used to make, pound, beat, strike. That can be beating something, striking something. It, it can also deal with, you know, metallurgy and, and um, smelting iron and things like that. That's why Pata is shown as the master craftsman and, and artisan and so forth. Um, he's at the center of Earth, the innermost core of Earth, fashioning the fire at the innermost core of Earth and dealing with the thermodynamics that generate the shape of the planet, the same thing at the center or the core of the sun, other planets within our bodies and so forth. So all it means to strike, to make, to pound, to establish, to do, and so forth. Adie means a thing, object, deed, entity. So abo die, abo die is he makes or he creates the thing. He fashions things. He's the fashioner of the thing, the fashioner or the maker of the thing. It's not creating something out of nothing. That's Ra and Rayat bring things into existence, bring entities into existence, bring life into existence. Then Pata fashions the energy that was brought into being by Ra and Raya and fashions it into specific forms to, so that we can execute our specific objectives. So that's the difference between the two. Ra and Raya, Nyonkumpo and Nyonkumpo gives us the life energy that animates all created entities. Once you have that life vitality moving through and animating divine fire, light energy, heat moving through, um, creation, then you have Pata who takes that energy and fashions it into specific forms. So first, let's, we're going to talk about the cosmology, the provenance of Pata, then we're going to get into his work of fashioning, who he is, and we're going to deal with that, um, the Shabaka text. When we're talking about um, the cosmology, dealing with the provenance of Pata, um, you look at the Kukutuntun, the ancestral jurisdiction, and we put the link in the chat room. Um, that's one of our publications, of course. We have that in soft cover as well as, um, you know, um, uh, PDF, ebook versions. And we talk about Pata in that section, talking about his work of fashion. So first, when you talk about the supreme being, Amen, Amenet. As, and as we mentioned this before, Amen is Amen means. Amen means hidden or concealed, invisible, same with Amenet. Men also means permanent, stable, and abiding. So you have the great mother and the great father, the great being that is hidden, that great entity, just like your spirit. You allow just like magnetism. You, you don't see magnetism, but you know of its effect because you can feel it, you can deal with it, you can operate and utilize it. Amen and Amenet, just like your spirit is hidden, Somebody may not be able to see your spirit just with their regular vision, but you're that hidden spirit, that invisible spirit, that force is what's animating your physical body. Amen, amen that there's a great father, great mother, hidden, 
I'm in, I'm in that. But they are stable, permanent, and abiding men. The great stable and permanent abiding being that is hidden or concealed or invisible that undergirds the created universe. And, of course, the only way you could have a created universe that's stable is to have an undergirding, stable, permanent, and abiding entity that, that stabilizes that, this created universe. So that's, I'm in, I'm in that. When they decide they want to create the universe, first they give birth to their expansive and contractive forces that become known as Ka and Kaet, the capacity to generate forms, thoughts, ideas, the divine consciousness, a male and female force, expansive and contractive, that can generate forms that never existed before. You have a a ka and kai, a soul, a divine consciousness within you, and you can direct your ka, your soul, your divine consciousness to generate forms within the blackness of your mind. As we always use that, that example of somebody laying in a dark room asleep when there's no light, no images, and you can generate forms, thought forms, ideas, and luminous images in your mind, in your spirit. Your ka is behind that process. You have the capacity to generate those forms harmoniously. So your ka is able to do that. If somebody walked in the room, they wouldn't be able to see what you're experiencing because it's dark and silent. When you are experiencing luminous images, dreams, or whatever, your ka is behind the fashioning of harmonious, um, you know, naturally occurring spiritual forms, images, and so forth. You can direct your ka to generate a form, generate a thought, an idea, a luminous image that you may want to, that you want to create something that's never been created before. You can generate and form an image of something that never existed before in your mind. Later, you'll get the physical materials to make that thing happen physically so you can actually make it in front of you. But first, it's generated in the darkness of your mind. Your ka is generating that form. And kaet the female. So that's because your ka and ka is a little drop from the great ka and ka. They were given birth by Amen and Amenet, two entities. They manifest as the black substance of space, which the white now spring now call dark energy and dark matter, which is a substance of plasma within which all things in the universe exist. Planets, suns, moons, stars are in that thick black substance. A portion of that black substance of space is inside of our bodies as the black substance within which all of our organs, systems, blood vessels, and everything dwell, and that's what we call abatum in our con culture. It's called melanin in English, that black substance that gives you your skin color, and your hair color, your eye color, but it's also in your organs and systems and 12 centers of the brain and so forth, and apexes in the brain but it's throughout your entire body. And just like you have a pyramid or a mare that, you know, is a structure, but it apexes at the tip, at the top, at the point, you have a body, first you were a little zygote, you, you stretched out, you have the black substance all throughout your system, but it apexes and crests in the head, in the brain, within the neural melon. So that black substance out in space, a portion of that, a tiny portion of that is inside of your body and all of your organs and organ systems have that within them. They really manifested from that from the time you were conceived. So just like the plant, suns, moons, stars, and planets and everything else manifest out of that black substance, same thing with your organs and organ systems, which are the planets and suns and so forth inside of your body. They manifest out of that black substance. So that's the con kayak. And within that black substance, those two forces, male and female forces, they have the capacity to generate form. When they do generate a form, luminous images within the black substance, then those forms are given vitality. Amen and Amenet therefore gave birth to Hehu and Hehu, the male and female expansive and contractive forces of vitality, the breath that manifests as breath in the physical world, expansion and contraction. So you have a form that's generated by Khan Kayat, Hehu and Hehu, the energy of expansion and contraction moves through that form to give it vitality, breathing, life. Next, that living 
perform has to have the power to be able to execute, to move. And the divinities Nun and Nunet, or Nun and Nunet, were created by Amen and Amenet, that primordial energy that's given, that magnetic type energy that's given, that subsists within you, even when you're not operating, when you're not about to move and do something, you have a primordial, um, stable energy within in yourself that you can draw on. When you're ready to move, then you intensify it and you make that energy begin to move and, and explode at some point. But before that happens, it's just a um, inert energy that's humming, ready for you to idle or kick into full gear. That's noon and nunet, the energy within creation, the reservoir of energy that exists when the black, within the black substance that can be drawn on to make things happen. So you have amen, amenet, kaan, kayet, hehu, and hehu, noon, and nunet. When noon and nunet, that energy within the black substance unites and begins to intensify, that wave energy becomes a spiraling energy, and then there's an explosion of fire and light and spirals of fire and light, circular energy moving, that's the birth of Ron Riot. The first fire and light in the universe, the black substance of space, is pierced with light, Ron Riot that divine great spirit, they begin to move and spiral through the black substance, carving out black spheres. Those black spheres become eventually stars, which later give birth to planets and so forth. But when Ra and Riot are moving through the black substance, spiraling through black substance and carving out black spheres, those black spheres eventually are going to become the first stars. The stars, of course, are black bodies according to physics, and of course we know that that's part of our cosmology. So when Ra and Riet are moving through the black substance to carve out the first entities, once those black spheres are formed, now the next step, so we don't always, we hadn't always talked about the details of step by step, the next step, we will talk about, you know, black spheres will eventually become stars and eventually give birth to planets and so forth. How do they become stars? Well, Ron and Riot give them life, bring them out of the black substance, and now they exist as entities, these black spheres. And their energy penetrates these black spheres to make them vibrant and begin to glow and, and become luminous. But then Amen and Aminet direct the divinity Pata into the center or the core of these spheres. And his expansive and contractive force, along with the female divinity, Sechima or Sekhmet, their expansive and contractive forces within the core of these spheres, generates the thermodynamics within these spheres. Everything you learn about in physics with regard to thermodynamics within the stars, um, eventually planets, the cores, core of planets, the inner core, inner inner core, and the core and the mantle and everything else. It starts off with that core, that moving energy, that expansive, contractive, moving energy within the core. Thermodynamics gives shape to, because of the way it moves, gives shape to those spheres. That's Pata and on the female side, Sechima, and they're, they're the ones who give form. So Ra and Riet bring things into being out of nothing. Nothing meaning no things, meaning the black substance that has no form at that particular time. The forms would be generated by the black substance, but Ra and Riot bring them into being. So they, things come into being through Ra and Riot, and they're given life through that fiery energy. Now that they're fashioned, the first black spheres, and they're luminous, now Pata, the spirit Pata, and Sachima are put into the center of these things and they begin to expand and contract and generate thermodynamics which generate the form of these things. So Pata is constantly moving within the inner core of the suns, various suns, later when the planets are developed from the solar orbs. The inner core of the planets is where you find Pata constantly moving, expanding, contracting, shaping, fashioning, that's why they show Pata mummified, show him with the, you know, the headdress that looks like a skull cap, often inside of a shrine space, but he's the one inside, mummified, deep, deep, deep within the core, fashioning, and they show him as the master craftsman 
um, smelter of metals and so forth, you steep within the core, fashioning the iron in the core, the liquid iron and the metals and everything that's birthed within the core. The thermodynamics come from him on the masculine side and such him on the feminine side. So that's why he's shown like that, embedded within something. And he's moving, expanding, contracting, fashioning. And they talk about the top fashioning things with his two hands and, and so forth. That's in the physical world. So in the innermost core of the planets, sun, moon, stars, everything else. And when the planets, um, for example, our planet, Earth Mother, Asatya Fua, is separated as a black sphere, Ron Rice energy penetrates that sphere, illuminates it, gives it life, um, separates the, you know, denser portions from the lighter, and then you have the, you know, the core, you have the water surrounding the entire planet. Everything that's going on, um, Patah is in the core, innermost core of the planet Earth, fashioning, expanding, contracting, generating that heat, that electromagnetic energy coming from the core, coming from the iron core and so forth, and radiating out towards the, you know, um, towards the surface of Earth and, of course, into the atmosphere as well, and generating, participating in the generation of that magnetosphere, the thermodynamics in the core, the um, axis, as well as the electromagnetic energy from the sun, all of that has to do with the magnetosphere, but Ta's central to that process, of course. Um, so he, he's there fashioning, working, doing his thing. Eventually, just like he was at the core of the original stars and fashioning those, he's at the core of our planet, fashioning the surface, what would become the surface of Earth because of his, because of his work. Then he begins to fashion what the surface is fashion, fashioning and refining through his work, through his movements, refining the different aspects of the planet Earth. So there's desert land, mountain regions, um, you know, fertile regions, because of his movement, because of his work, because of his fashioning, his, because of his expansion and contraction, he's fashioning the various aspects of features geologically, topographically, across the planet. That's why he's the one who fashions everything. So this is the provenance or the origin of the top and his functioning. Now we're going to get into, um, let's get into the Shabaka text, and it picks up, it has a number of, it's a number of different things in the Shabaka text. He, they touch on a number of different things, including the cosmological functions. Um, maybe we should get into, well, first, before we get into the Shabaka text, just like he fashion, he's at the center of the core of Earth, He's also in the core of the Afurakani and Afuraikaiti, male and female, as well as in the core of animals and so forth. His center of resonance is in the brain. Um, when you first the zygote, when you conceived, the sperm and ovum unite, you're a little zygote, circular cell. Eventually, of course, you stretch out and become the form that you are now. But that central piece, you know, the brain, the heart, and so forth, um, Pata is right there in the center, fashioning, fashioning your form, making sure your form is taking the form that was encoded within your divine consciousness of what you were going to be and what your functions are and so forth. So he's there. And then when you develop, of course, um, and stretch out then that his center of resonance in your body is in the brain. The formative the brain has all the you know, blueprints of everything that you're supposed to have, you're supposed to function, how you're to operate, and everything else. The formative part of the spirit, Okra, the Okrawa, Ata is there fashioning and making sure everything that happens that's encoded within your crowd, what your function is. What kind of spirit are you? Are you a fiery entity? Are you an immune system cell in the body? Are you a healing cell? Whatever you were given by the supreme being to execute in the world, Ata fashions that and forms that and encodes that within your spirit brain, within your craw, within your physical brain, which is the seat of your craw. He's the one who makes that happen, makes it real, makes sure that the blueprint that was given or the directions that were given by Inyame wa Inyame, he lays out the blueprint to make sure it happens. So somebody can decide they want to have a certain kind of building, and then you have the architect who lays out the blueprint to make that desire happen, and he gives all the specifications. Ta is the force that takes the desire of Amen, Amenet, 
and blueprints it and then works to make it happen. So that's that's the piece that we didn't always go into details about. That's the you know the intervening piece that we, we're talking about. So he makes that happen. The same thing he does within your body. He does it within your spirit. So your your cross the formative part of your spirit, formulating thoughts, intentions, and eventually actions, behavior. So if you look at the way the earth is formed, then once the earth is formed, then a spirit can take up residence in the earth. Just, just like your body. Your body is formed, or there's a zygote, then your spirit can take up residence in the conception, the newly conceived zygote. Um, a planet is formed. Once Ptah fashions the planet and fashions the mountains and the oceans and the rivers and so forth, then... Ra and Ra'et can send their children, the various abosom and spirits, to take up residence in the ocean, take up residence in the mountains, take up residence in the rivers, take up residence different aspects of the earth, you know, um, portions of the earth. So first Ptah fashions them, and then their spirits take up residence, and they become the abosom of the mountain, the abosom of the river, the abosom, and so forth, because they have their own functions as well. The same thing happens within your body. So you have a specific form, different organs, organ systems, Pata fashions those, energy moves through those. But then spiritually, you have a specific function, Pata, you know, fashions that within your brain, your spirit's brain. But when you have thoughts and ideas, thoughts, intentions, and actions, if you have a function to be a, for example, in the immune system cell, you're naturally drawn to restore order and destroy disorder and so forth. You're engaged in that process. You're nat naturally drawn to uphold justice and things like that. Um, so that's your encropia, your encra, your function. Pata forms that within you. When you're in harmony with Pata, your thoughts and intentions and eventually actions will be in harmony with him. So the kinds of thoughts that you form within yourself will be in alignment with what your function is because you're in tune with the top. So it's only kind of thoughts you will form and later your intentions that you will form and later your behaviors that you will manifest will be based on what he encoded within your crop, that he blueprinted within your crop under the direction of inyame wa inyame. But if you're out of harmony with him, you'll generate all kinds of thoughts, intentions, actions, but they won't be thoughts that were fashioned by Ptah based on the blueprint that was given by Inyame wa Inyame. They'll be based on some misinformation or things that you've been getting from other people, drawn from other people and so forth, and you'll generate perverse thoughts, which lead to perverse intentions and perverse action. But when Ptah is fashioning form, when you, just like a planet, once a planet is fashioned, and because it has energy at the core, it generates a magnetic field. That field becomes, you know, it's magnetic, it, it, and it can draw other smaller entities into its orbit, just like the moon is drawn into the orbit of planet Earth, Asasea 4. The planets in our solar system are drawn into the orbit of the Oria of the sun, and it has that powerful magnetic pull, and they can't, you know, drift outside of that orbit because the, the pull is too strong. If you have a magnet on the table, once a little paper clip or something gets close enough to the field, the magnetic field, then it'll be drawn into its orbit and drawn directly to the magnet. If you have a, um, a wire, you wrap it around, you know, in, in a circle, in a series of circles, and then you put both ends of the wire to a battery. Once the electric energy starts circulating and whipping through that circle that you created, now you will create an electromagnetic field field, and then you can move that little circle around and you can pick up paper clips and things like that because you generated an electromagnetic field from that substance. It's the same thing with the thought forms that you generate within your sunsum, within your spirit. If the thought forms that you fashion are in harmony with what Pata, are in harmony with the deity Pata, the great divine fashioner, then in harmony with him, you will fashion thoughts that are harmonious. The thought becomes a matrix or a matrix. It's an entity just like a planet. It's a spiritual force. It's a spiritual entity. Imagine a, a 
a ball of energy, a ball of light or a ball of energy. That's what a thought is. It's a matrix. When you generate that little thought or a little planet, then it develops its own gravitational pull. So that's what you're doing. If you generate a kind of thought that's out of harmony with order because you're being influenced by other people, then those thoughts as matrices generate the kind of gravitational pull that will compel you or impel you to engage, generate perverse intentions and engage in corrupt behavior. If you generate thoughts that are in harmony with Pata, being, you mean thoughts that are fashioned based on your actual function and creation, then those thoughts, energetic matrices, will have that kind of magnetic pull on you, pull on your spirit to force you to generate intentions that are harmonious and manifest behaviors that are harmonious. So Pata is fashioning thoughts. When you get out of harmony with him, then the thoughts you fashion are corrupt and that leads to negative behaviors. When you get in contact with other individuals that are corrupt or, or misguided or whatever, and you try to, you know, operate and think on the same lines as them, you start generating thought forms, which are like little planets, which are like little circular um, spheres of energy, and their gravitational pull begins to make you engage in behavior that's self-destructive. And that's what happens with people very often when they're, quote, unquote, mentally ill. They're generating thought forms. They're giving birth to little planetary forms of thought in their head, and it draws them to engage in self-destructive behavior. When we're in harmony with Pata, we can get the blueprint of what our function is. Nya may assign us a specific divinity to draw within our head region, and we're pulled in one direction or the other um, by that force in our head region, the reason why we're pulled in one direction or the other is because the Supreme Being also directed Pata to fashion the blueprint of what our function is to be. So the deity within our head region, our Kra, it relies on the blueprint that was established by Pata. So if you look at your brain, that's the physical seat of, you know, everything you need to do. The spiritual, the spirit brain is the Okra. And the reason why the Okra is divided, just like your physical brain is divided up into the left hemisphere, right hemisphere, cerebellum, left hemisphere, right hemisphere. It's a blueprint and has a bunch of different instructions wired within it. That's the physical brain. The spirit brain is the same way. It's a little deity dwelling within your head region. You can feel it pulling you in one direction or the other. That is the, you know, your Okra, male, Okrawa, female, Ka, Kaed, your Ori, Inu. Why is it able to pull you in one direction or the other? Why is it? Because encoded within it is the specific function you were given to execute in the world. Who encoded it is the difference we're talking about tonight. We always talk about how the your okra, your spirit's brain, is encoded with a specific function. Say you're to be a healer, so you have that function encoded within your spirit's brain. So your spirit's brain, that force in your head, is always pulling you towards healing in a harmonious fashion restoring order in a harmonious fashion because encoded within your spiritual brain is that function. What we're talking about tonight is who did the encoding? Inyame announced that that's what you're supposed to be and directed your cross to take up residence in your spirit so the divinity that governs your head is in your spirit. But who encoded the messages and the blueprints within that divinity? That's Pata. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. Those are more nuanced things. So we're going to get into, we just want to show how just like he fashions planets and stars and everything else, and they have their own um, magnetic pull, magnetosphere, and gravitational pull and can pull things into their orbit. He does the same thing in your body physically, so you have a magnetosphere as well. You have an aura. You have a magnetosphere. People can feel your energy if they're close to you. You can put your hands close to your face, and you can feel the heat emanating from you. That's the denser part of your aura, and the further you get out, it's less dense. But you have a magnetic field around you, um, and people can you can, you know, experience that. But even your thought forms, they're not just beliefs. 
When you have a thought and you focus on it, you're generating a form, an entity. Just like when you're dreaming and you generate a dream, that's a, you're seeing a specific form. You're seeing luminous forms. Any form that's fashioned, if, it, if it's a structure, if it's a form and it has luminous energy, then it also has a magnetic field. So when you generate thought forms, you're generating magnetic fields. If the thought form is out of harmony with Pata's blueprint, then you're ge generating an entity, a little planet, that's going to pull negative individuals towards you, but also influence you to engage in negative behavior or self-destructive or disordered behavior. When you generate thought forms in harmony with Pata, the blueprint that's laid out in your spirit's brain, then therefore you will begin to be, you will feel a compulsion by that thought form that's generating in your head, you'll feel a compulsion to act in a harmonious fashion. And you'll feel a repulsion from engaging in this harmonious behavior. When you are harmonized with Pata and generate proper thought forms, then, for example, if you're supposed to be eating certain kinds of food, you know, healthy food or whatever, when you generate those thought forms in harmony with Pata, then you'll be naturally impelled and compelled to harmonize with that harmonious thought form. So you will only want to eat the healthy food. And when somebody tries to give you some food that's not good for you, even though you may have liked the way it tastes, you will be repulsed by it, even though you like the way it tastes. But the idea of trying to engage thinking and intentionally and acting on embracing something that's out of harmony with the thought form you've already generated in your head and harmony with the time, it will be repulsive to you and you won't want to eat the food that you used to eat. You'll only want to, you know, eat the healthy food. It's the same thing with engaging in other behaviors. When you generate those harmonious thought forms, give birth to them based on your alignment with the top, then you'll be repulsed by disordered behavior, intentions, thoughts, actions, and you'll be naturally drawn magnetically towards proper behavior because those little thought forms are dwelling within your spirit and they're affecting your body. So um, so let's, before we get in a little bit further, make sure there wasn't any questions. All right. So we're going to get into the um, Shabaka text. And there's a number of things we're going to go through. Um, okay. So the Shabaka, so the stone, the, the king, Ainsu, or Pera'a, so-called Pharaoh, Shabaka. Um, what, what happened was when he took over, it was one of the, what they call the, quote-unquote, Kushite dynasty, quote-unquote, Nubian dynasty. Basically, um, people from the south, um, after a certain intermediate period, came from the south and, and came up back into Kemet. These were people who were descended from traditional rulers of Kemet. They had moved to the south. Some of them came back from the south to restore order because Kemet had been breaking down um, politically. They wanted to restore the original culture. There have been invasions from the White Narrow Spring in the north, corruption going on. There was an intermediate period. The kings from the south came back. We're going to restore order and restore a new dynasty. So they call it the Nubian dynasty or the Kushite dynasty and so forth. White Narrow Spring call it that because they're trying to pretend as though that dynasty, 25th dynasty, came with a black dynasty, and all the other ones were non-black, which, of course, is not accurate. They did come out of Kanit, out of Nubia, though, um, but they were descended from people who were from ancient Kemet. They were descended from priests and priestesses of Amen and everything else. So they were the same people. Some of them went further south when things were breaking down politically. They took up, you know, refuge in the south but when it was time for them to wage war and come back. They were like, we're going to take back over, and they moved back up north and did their thing. Um, what what happened is uh, Shabaka, they, he reestablished the capital in ancient Menefa, which is mis misnomer Memphis, which was the ancient capital going back to the um, old period or quote-unquote old kingdom thousands of years ago. He reestablished the capital there. That's the sacred center of Pata. It's called Anep Hetch meaning the white walls, that's the sacred sanctuary of Ptah. Of course, when it's talking about the white walls and the sacred sanctuary, the center of government was that region for a very long time, and they're restoring that. Um, the white walls and the sacred sanctuary of, of the center of government, of 
course, this is where you get the center of government being contained within the White House in America, the white walls of the White House, the sacred sanctuary of the center of government in this country this is where they get that from. And, of course, when you look at the various um, structures and government buildings with the pylons and everything else, they're just imitations of ancient Kemet, whether it's the uh, tech in which they call the, you know, the obelisk or the Washington Monument to so all the various governmental buildings. They they look like they're knockoffs of temples of ancient Kemet. So, um, but the Adnep Hetch or the White Walls as a sacred sanctuary, but that's not just the physical sanctuary, which is the center of government in Kemet, and the you, you know the actual white the building the, with the white walls and so forth. But inside your body is also the white walls, which are the sanctuary of Pata within your body. We said Pata operates through the brain, the formative part of the spirit and the formative part of the body, which is the brain that formulates all the, you know, um, actions and movements of everything that needs to happen. The cerebral cortex is a whitish, grayish, fleshy area. Those are the white walls, the Adnet Hetch. And then within that, you have the you know, the um, the midbrain, which is um, a limbus, which they call the limbic portion, which is, limbus just means a cap. Um, and the cerebral cortex is like on top of the limbus, on the cap portion. When you look at the top, he's wrapped in white, he's mummified, but then he wears that skull cap type headdress. That's the limbus. And then he's inside the white walls, which is the cerebral cortex, on the hedge and Pata south of his wall and so forth, that's what they're talking about. So it's talking about the, the physical topography of Kemet and st establishing the, you know, the center of government in that region, in the white wall section. It's the same thing within the body as well. So what happened was Shabaka established, reestablished the center of civilization, center of the nation, government in Minnefer, reestablished that. He found the text that he said was a text from the ancestresses and ancestors, and it had been worm-eaten. Worm and what he wanted to do, because it was an ancient text, and it had specific information that was key about the cosmology and the culture, it was a, something written down by the ancestresses and ancestors thousands of years before he came, and, but it had been worm-eaten. What he decreed was that this text to be rewritten on and carved in a stone so that it could be everlasting. So, and that's what they did. Thousands of years later, the White Snarl Spring invading Kemet during the time of Napoleon and everything, they found this stone and people were using it as a grinding stone for grain and stuff like that. But they found the stone, they found these medutu on the stone, they were like, this must be important, and they took it away, took it to the museums and eventually began to transliterate and so forth. So we're going to read the first portion. A number of titles of the, the king. It says, the living Heru who prospers the two lands, um, talking about upper and lower Kemet, as well as Kemet and Kanit. Uh, the two ladies, talking about Nekabet and Wachet, who prospers the two lands. The golden Heru who prospers the two lands. King of upper and lower Kemet. Nefer Ka Ra, the son of Ra, Shabaka, beloved of Ptah, south of his wall, who lives like Ra forever. This writing was copied out anew by his majesty in the house of his father, Ptah, south of his wall, for his majesty found it to be a work of the ancestresses and ancestors which was worm-eaten, so that it could not be understood from the beginning to end. His majesty copied it anew so that it became better than it had been before, in order that his name might endure and his monument last in the house in the house of his father Ptah south of his wall throughout eternity as a work done by the son of Ra Shabaka for his father Ptah Tanen so that he might live forever so that's just the introduction talking about how he came across this work why he reestablished it and put it back out because it was a work of the ancestresses and ancestors critical information and he wants to establish it so it will last for all time and so that his name would endure. Of course, that's what has happened. And he understood that would happen because he did this. And, of course, uh, 20, like 2,600 years later, 27, 26 to 2,600 years later, we are 
reading this text now. So his name has endured, and we're honoring Shabaka for preserving this information, talking about Patat, detailed, one of the most detailed texts dealing with this divinity that has been preserved. And because what he did back then, he understood it will last for, for thousands of years, and it has lasted for thousands of years, and it's back in the hands as far as the information, the fact that Akurakani, Akurakani people, descendants of Shabaka, are, um, have access to the text now is a you know, a, um, testament to what he understood he was doing. So it starts talking about the battle between Heru and Set first, and then later on it gets into the cosmological aspect. We're going to go through quickly the portion of talking about aspects of the battle of Heru and Set because it's, it's important. Um, so it's all, and, and this is also this portion talking about Heru and Set is also um, addressed again at the end of the text. There was some this because it was a grinding stone and people been using it for hundreds of years as a grinding stone. Some portions were ground out, but then when they restated the information later on in the text, you could see what, what portions had been ground away and they had restated the same cosmology, so they they were able to re you know recognize what would have been at the top portion. It was also rewritten at the bottom portion as well. So um, it says, King of Upper and Lower Kemetis, this is Pata, who is called the great name, Tatanen, south of his wall, Lord of Eternity. The joiner of Upper and Lower Kemet is he, this uniter, who arose as a king of Upper Kemet and arose as a king of Lower Kemet. Um, Self-begotten, so says Atem, who created the nine divinities. Then it says, Geb, the Lord of the nine deities, commanded that the nine deities gather to him. He judged between Heru and Set. This is Geb now, the father of Osar, Oset, Set, and Nebit Heb. He judged between Heru and Set. He ended their quarrel. He made Set the king of Upper Kemet in the land of Upper Kemet up to the place which he is born, which is Su. And, and Geb made Heru the king of Lower Kemet in the land of Lower Kemet, up to the place in which his father was drowned, which is the division of the two lands. That's in northern Kemet. And that's key. We're going to talk about why it's key. Thus, Heru stood over one region, and Set stood over one region. They made peace over the two lands at Ayan. That was the division of the two lands. So Geb's words to Set, go to the place in which you were born. So that was set up a command. Geb's words to Heru, go to the place in which your father was drowned. Heru going to northern command. Geb's words to Heru and Set, I have separated you lower and upper command. Then he reflected, and then it says, it seemed wrong to Geb that the portion of Heru was like the portion of Set, meaning it was the same. So Geb gave Heru his inheritance, for he is the son of his firstborn son. Geb's words to the so-called Ennead or the Postjatu, the nine divinities, I have appointed Heru the firstborn. Him alone, Heru the inheritance, to his heir, Heru my inheritance. To his firstborn, Heru the opener of the ways, the son who was born, Heru, on the birthday of the opener of the ways. So at first he gave set southern commit and Heru Northern Kemet, then he reassessed it and said, you know what, I'm going to give Heru the, my inheritance because the throne of Geb is the throne of earth on the masculine side. Um, Osar was the firstborn son of Geb. Then Osar was given the inheritance, the throne of Geb, the throne of earth on the masculine side. Then, of course, Set kills Osar and he took over. Then there's a battle between Heru and Set. And then first Geb said, well, I'm going to give my inheritance to the throne of earth. Now that Osar is deceased, I'm going to um, separate Heru and Set, give Set one portion and Heru the other portion. Then he reassessed and said, you know what, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm giving it all to Heru because he deserves all of it. So, so that's what the text is saying. Then Heru stood over the land. He is the uniter of this land, proclaimed in the great name Ta Tanen, south of his wall, Lord of Eternity, then sprouted to two great 
um, magicians, but it's really talking about Nekabet and Wachet upon his head, the vulture and the cobra. Um, he is Heru who arose as king of Upper and Lower Kemet, who united the two lands in the gnome of the wall, the place in which the two lands were united. Reed and Papyrus were placed on the double door of the house of Ptah. That means Heru and Set were pacified and united. They fraternized so as to cease quarreling in whatever place they might be, being united in the house of Ptah, the balance of the two lands in which Upper and Lower Kemet had been weighed. So Heru and Set um, came to peace after that. After Jeb made his judgment, everything was given to Heru. He inherited the throne of Jeb, which had passed through Asar. Now Heru and Set fraternized. They were at peace like brothers, and now they were, you know, everything was balanced in the two lands. Then it says, this is the land, the burial of Asar and the house of Seker, Aset and Nebuchadnezzar, without delay, for Asar had drowned in his water. This is talking about a different section of the cosmology. Asar had drowned in his water, meaning Set had originally thrown Asar and drowned him in the region of Ndat, or Ndata, um, and they say Asar had drowned or was submerged in the water. And, of course, he was eventually, you know, thrown in a coffin and thrown in the water. Aset and Nebuchadnezzar looked, they behold, they beheld him, attended to him. Haru spoke to Aset and Nebuchadnezzar, hurry up and grasp him. Aset and Nebuchadnezzar spoke to Asar, we come to take you. So they, they caught his body, brought him to the dry land. Then it says, he entered the hidden portals in the glory of the Lord of eternity. He came into the earth at the royal fortress to the north of the land which he had come. And his son, Heru, arose as king of upper Kemet, arose as king of lower Kemet, in the embrace of his father, Alsar, and the deities in front of him and behind him. And then there was built a royal, fort, a royal fortress um, at the command of Geb and so forth. And they talk about a few more things. Now, the reason why we said that's key, that little snapshot, when they found Alsar's body and they grasped him, they saw him submerging in the water, they grasped him, brought him into the, you know, brought him out the water, and they facilitated spiritually the resurrection of Alsar, and he came into his glory um, at the royal fortress to the north of the land which he had come. That's key because he became the king of the north, the chief of the north. And we talked about that earlier in the text when he talked about um, Heru being given initially the land of the north first and then the land of the north and the south. When Asar becomes the chief of the north and resurrected and came into his glory in the north, he's heady chief, king, he was above, ruler, heady, Mahari, and then met, which means north. Hedi Met or Hori Met means chief or king of the north. Hori Met became corrupted into Shori Met, Sholi Met, Soli Met. And we talked about this in the Cuckoo's and Tomb. Soli Met becomes Soli Man and Solomon. We talked about Aset operating through the star system, Sapatit, which is Sirius, called Sapatit, later called Sapat, Saba, Shaba, and Sheba. So when the queen of Sapatit, meaning Aset, operating through the star system, Sapatit or Sapat or Saba or Shaba or Sheba, meets with Horimet or Holimet, Sholimet, Solimet, Solomon, that's the queen of Sheba and Solomon, queen of the south, meaning the king of the north, uniting, and then they give birth to Heru in Sapatit or Heru in Sapat, Heru in Shaba or Siba or Saba, that's Benal Lekim. Hera Rekit, the son of Rekit, the son of Aset. Menalekim becomes Menalek. So that whole story of Solomon, Shiva, and Menalek is coming from Asar, Aset, and Heru operating through the star system, Sapatid, and of course Asar operating through Orion. So we just want to show that this is where you get the, the, the importance of Asar being connected with the north when he's resurrected and comes into his glory in the north and becomes Hedy Met, the chief of the north. This is where we get that from. This is where the, that's the cosmological basis for that. In the Kukudun Tun, we go into detail showing how Solomon, Sheba, and Menelik are connected to the star systems, Orion and Sirius, and that whole story plays out every year. It has nothing to do with any, there was no black king named Solomon. 
There was no black queen named Sheba. There was no, you know, Menelik. So when they talk about Menelik the second of Ethiopia, he shouldn't have been the second because there was never a Menelik the first. So they're totally fictional characters who never existed. So that whole story in the Kebra Nagath is pure nonsense coming from the whites and their offspring who negatively influenced the black people in Ethiopia. They embraced that fake religion, tried to blacken it up and make it part of their culture, with it, which it has nothing to do with them at all. It's a white corruption of fragments of our culture. All right, so um, now we're going to get into the cosmology as it is found on the Shabaka text to give further nuance and details about the Taz functioning in creation, as well as in the spirit and so forth. So first they list the deities who came into being in Ptah. Ptah on the great throne. They talk about Ptah Nun, Ptah Nunet. Ptah the great, its heart and tongue of the nine divinities. Ptah who bore the deities. They talk about Ptah Nephitim who rose at the nose of Ra every day. Nephitim is the Ptah Sechima Sekhmet. So it says there took shape in the heart that took shape on the tongue, the form of Atem, for the very great one is Ptah, who gave life to all of the divinities and their cause through his heart, through his and tongue, in which Heru had taken shape as Ptah, in which Tehuti had taken shape as Ptah. Thus the heart and tongue rule over all the limbs in accordance with the teaching that it, the heart, is in every body, and it, the tongue, is in every mouth of all, Deities, all men, all cattle, all creeping things, whatever lives, thinking, whatever it wishes and commands, whatever it or he or she wishes, um, his, any it or divinities before him as teeth and lips. And it gets into talking about the any it of Atem, the company of deities of Atem. Um, they're the teeth and lips and the mouth and so forth. So it says a, a sight hearing, breathing, they all report to the heart, and it makes every understanding come forth. As to the tongue, it repeats what the heart has devised. Thus all the deities were born, and the company of deities was completed, for every word of the deity came about through what the heart devised and the tongue commanded. So we're talking about the heart and the tongue. They said the heart is associated with Heru, the tongue is associated with Tehuti, and the power is associated with Atem, and this is how Ptah creates. So let's get into talking about what they're actually talking about in this section. First, when you, we were talking about how Ptah fashions thought forms, ideas, matrices. The thoughts become literal matrices, vortices of energy, a little sphere of power of energy has its own magnetic field. When the thought is formed and is formed by Ptah, then the kind of behaviors that you're compelled to engage in you're pulled by that thought, that little planet that's dwelling in your head. Now, that little sphere of energy, it has its own magnetic pull. If it's a harmonious sphere of energy, it compels you to engage in behaviors, intentions and behaviors that are harmonious. If you generate thought forms that are out of harmony with Pata, of course, then you'll be compelled, magnetically drawn into the orbit of that negative thought, and your behavior will manifest that. So when it's talking about... Um, Pata fashioning forms what took shape in the heart and then took shape in the form of the tongue. If you look at the king, the, the structure of a Akan court, for example, you have the king, the Oheni, sitting there. Then you have the Ocheyame, which is his spokesperson, standing next to him with a staff. The king declares what the rule is going to be. He decides this is what's going to happen in the kingdom. When he decides that, he tells the Ochiyami, his spokesperson, his spokesperson stands there with the staff, and then he announces, he speaks what the king has declared. The king is the heart, just like the heart in your body is the king in your body in that sense, in the lower section of the body. So you have the, the lower section of the body and the upper section of the body is the head. The king in the lower section of the body is the heart. That's the king within the Akan court structure. The tongue or the spokesperson of the king standing there with the staff is the Ocheame. He's the mouthpiece of the king. People don't speak directly to the king. They speak to the Ocheame. Then the Ocheame whispers into the ear of the king. Then the king whispers in the ear of the Ocheame. And then he 
and then he announces what the king said to the whole population. That's in the court structure, so in the palace, so um, the ahimvia. So it's the same thing with our with us. The heart is the the king or the queen mother sitting in the middle, um, and then the tongue is that they said Tehuti is associated with the tongue. He's the one who speaks what's in the heart, what's in the desire. So amen, amenet decide what your function is going to be. They encode that within your spiritual head, within your ka, and so forth. And Pata lays out the blueprint and encodes it and imprints it within your spiritual brain. That's what you're supposed to do. And because what's it's fashioned in your brain physically and spiritually of what you're supposed to do, and Pata has made that happen, then it generates that electromagnetic field. And then you start having the desire to actually move in that direction because what's been formed within your spiritual brain generates a magnetosphere and and orbit and a magnetic attraction, and then your spirit is drawn to do what's been formed into your brain. Again, if you form something else because you were influenced by somebody else, then your spirit will be drawn. You'll have a natural compulsion and be like, oh, I want to do this now because you have formed some foolish thought in your brain and you're you're like, I don't know what, why I did it. I just felt like I wanted to do it. I know it's wrong, but I couldn't help myself because you fashioned this, this thought form and it became a powerful thought form. You can reprogram yourself by realigning with Pata and fashion a real thought form, a harmonious thought form. So when Pata fashions that thought form, then the heart generates a desire. Why does the heart have the desire? Because what was fashioned in the brain by Pata of that, that, that orbit, that magnetic field reaches down to the heart and stimulates the heart. Now the heart has the desire to make what's in the brain happen. And then once the heart has that desire and starts pumping and sending that energy, then what comes out of the mouth, the tongue, is a replication of what the heart has the desire to do. The tongue enunciates, explicates what needs to be done. So you have, first it's fashioned in your mind, then your heart generates that desire because it's fashioned by the time in the mind, and then you speak, this is what I'm going to do. And when you speak, you release those sound vibrations and start affecting either people to move in a certain direction to get the resources to make it happen, or when you engage in ritual prayer, you're affecting energetic matrices to make matter move so you can begin to make things happen. So when they talk about the heart and the tongue working together, whatever's in the heart, the tongue announces what's in the heart, and then those things come into being, it's talking about that, that process. Even physically, when you have the heart and lung complex working together, they send that energy, and that, that energy is pumping and so forth. Then when you talk about the tongue, when the air comes up from the heart and lung complex through the trachea and into the mouth, then the tongue, the movement of the tongue regulates the flow of the air and it determines and it defines what's coming out. So if you you breathe out and you say, ah, and then you move your tongue up to the roof of your mouth, ah becomes ah, and it becomes an in sound. The movement of the tongue, depending on the, which way the tongue moves, it regulates the flow of air coming from the trachea, and that determines the various sounds that we make. You can, you know, make your tongue move in certain ways, put it in front of the teeth, pull it back, and the various sounds began to manifest. So what's in the heart and lung region, once the tongue regulates the flow of air, which carries life force energy, the tongue regulating the flow of air defines what's coming out of the heart and lung region. It's the same thing spiritually. That energy that's moving through your body, when you um, attune to to Tehuti, the divine spokesperson, he regulates the flow of that energy and speaks what the heart is trying to say, speaks what the deity is trying to tell you to do, releases that sound vibration, ritual prayer, and it causes things to happen. So Tehuti is the spokesperson. He stands there with the staff, just like the Ocheame in our Khan culture stands there with the staff and announces what the king, what the heart is trying to say. So that's, that's what they're talking about. When the tongue, heart and the tongue are in harmony, then what is desired is spoken into existence, and the movement of matter, once things are spoken, once those sound vibrations are released, 
you know, sound vibrations can you can sing and break the glass, or you can feel sound vibrations that makes matter move. Once what's in the heart is enunciated by the tongue, then the sound vibrations are released and things begin to move, whether you're moving matter itself or you're moving people. Just like people can speak and stimulate people, the sound vibrations that emanate from somebody stimulates people and inspires them to move and act and do things that they otherwise weren't even thinking about doing. Sound vibrations have power and they travel and they affect people. So it starts out with the matrix that's fashioned by the top within the brain, the thought form. That matrix has a, a magnetosphere or an orbit or a magnetic field. It reaches down to the heart and stimulates the energy of the heart and the desires generated in the heart. And once the desire is generated in the heart, then the energy flowing up from the heart physically as well as spiritually is regulated by the tongue and enunciated by the tongue, and then you, you speak those things into existence, not just talking, not in a nonsensical sense when people say, all you've got to do is speak something to existence, it's going to happen. It doesn't happen that way. That's um, pseudo-spirituality. If you're not talking about pata, fashioning the thought forms first, and the divinity that governs your kra, you're not talking about them, and the deity Heru operating through the heart and Tehuti operating through the tongue, if you don't understand the interaction between those different divinities, then you don't understand talking about speaking something into existence. If that was the case, you can just say, I'm going to win the lottery today, and everybody would be speaking that into existence. It's not that simple, and it's, it's an ignorance of cosmology when they, people say things like that. If you're not in harmony with the forces in nature, then you're not speaking anything into existence. What you're doing is you're, re, you're just spitting out disordered vibrations. You're affecting certain people, and if they're receptive to it, they may respond or they may not respond. And with regard to things like the lottery and stuff like that, that's something created by the whites and their offspring to take money from poor people and transfer it to white people, basically. Make poor people all come together in various regions, take their little one or two dollars. Poor people who otherwise could spend, you know, if they generate in a certain zip code, they may generate six or seven million dollars in a poor neighborhood once a week in lottery sale tickets. And once one person gets that six or seven million dollars, even if they're black, they spend all that money in the white community buying you know, all kinds of things. So it's a way to snatch millions of dollars from poor people and reroute it to the whites and their offspring. So when people say, well, if you understand the deities and so forth, why don't they let you win the lottery? Well, that's not a scheme that they created. That's a scheme that the whites and their offspring created to steal money from us and transfer it to white people. So why would they insert themselves in a silly little scheme like that? What the Abosom teach us to do is to connect with our own people and encourage our own people instead of spending that kind of money with the quote-unquote lottery to pool those resources and take that 6 or $7 million weekly and build a school and a grocery store and everything else we need, uh, you know, health clinic and whatever we need right in the same community. We have the capacity to do that. If we believe we don't and we must, the only thing we can do and the only way we can make it is to just continue to play the lottery and pray to the deities and beg them to make us win. They don't participate in silly rationalizations like that. They participate in what's in harmony with order. They weren't created to come and help you win the lottery. They're created to direct you how to live in harmony with your function, and when you do that, then you will pool your resources and billions of dollars that we waste on fake hair and alcohol and cigarettes and so forth. We can redirect all that money to building an independent, you know, private schools in every black um, region of the country, wherever we are, building our own hospitals and everything else we need and establishing a base, a land, and an independent nation outside of America to do what we need to do. So that's just a side piece with that whole notion of talking things into existence because people like to repeat nonsense. So... That's what they're talking about when it's talking about the heart and tongue rule over the limbs in accordance with the teaching um, of the top. So they talk about that section, the heart and lung, I mean the heart and tongue working together. Um, then they say that any or the divinities of 
of the company of divinities that they call the Ennead is Atem, then Shu, Tefnu, Geb, Nut, Osar, Oset, Set, and Nebethet. Those nine divinities are often called in English the Ennead, coming from the Greek Ennead meaning the nine. We're talking about the company of divinities whose sacred sanctuary in Kemet was in the city of Anu, um, headed up by Atem. Um, so when they say those are the teeth and lips and the heart and tongue, you know, generates the desire and the enunciation of the desire, but then they say Atem's Ennead or company of divinities are the teeth and lips. So, when, again, when you speak and you first you generate the air from the lungs section, it goes up through the trachea, gets into the mouth, then the tongue, the movement of the tongue regulates the flow of air and it determines whether it's going to be an N sound or a sh sound or whatever it is. But then it's further defined with the teeth and the lips to properly enunciate everything. So that's talking about a creative process. It goes from just a surge of air and energy to being regulated through the tongue to be further refined, and then when you use your teeth and lips, you finish that refinement, and you have specific sounds, specific vibrations, specific releases of energy in potent units that can affect people, affect spirits, affect matter, and so forth. So that's why they say Atem's um, Ennead is the teeth and lips. They complete the process. We talked about Atem, or Odomakama last week. He's the finisher of creation, the one who takes the um, soil that came up out of the primordial ocean, makes it into a, a Tim hard contact substance, Tim to complete, Tim to finish, Tim the setting of the sun, which is the completion of the day and the end of the day, the begin end of one cycle, the begin beginning of another. So a Tim is the power of completion. He starts that part, just like Kepra, the explosive power of, of beginning, like the sunrise, a Tim completes the day, he's the sunset, but he completes the process and so forth. He's the power that completes what Heru and Tehuti are engaging in. He's the completing power. So that's why they talk about Atem's Ennead as the um, teeth and lips of Ptah. They finish that process. Um, so then it says, Thus all faculties were made and all the qualities determined. They that make all the foods and all provisions through his word, to him who does what is loved, to him who does what is hated, Thus, life is given to the peaceful, and death is given to the criminal. Again, that's talking about divine law and divine hate. It says, to him who does what is loved, to him does who does what is hated, life is given to the peaceful, death is given to the criminal. It's not, forgiveness is not given to the criminal, and death is given to the criminal because they do what is hated. And it says, thus, all labor, all crafts are made, the action of the hands, the motion of the legs, the movements of all limbs, according to this command, which is devised by the heart, comes forth on the tongue and creates the performance of everything. So that's what we're talking about. Not only are your own movements generated in your heart, enunciated by the tongue, the heart and the tongue working together and completed by our tongue, your movements of your legs, everything you do, it comes from the heart, desire of the heart and the tongue, First fashion by Pata. So that whole process is, they're repeating that process. Thus it is said that Pata, he who made and created the deity. When it's talking about created the deities, we're talking about when he fashions the forms of the divinity. Ra and Ra'et are the life force energy. They're the ones who bring things out of nothing, out of the black substance. Once they're brought out of nothing and brought into existence and are alive, top fashions their forms. It's like you can have fire is just fire. You can fashion a specific form so you can make that fire move through that form and it can accomplish a specific objective. You can create a specific form so that fire can move through it in the form of a laser and now the laser beam is a specific form of fire that can be directed in certain ways for surgery and other things. So for top just once he creates those forms, those forms become matrices that empower that life force energy in certain ways. And we're going to show that. Um, so that's why I said he, Pata created all the deities. Not that he created them, but he created the forms of the deities through which they operate. When he created the suns, fashioned the proper forms, 
fashion the ocean, fashion the desert lands, fashion, fashion the black land, fashion the mountains. Now, they have specific forms that have a specific configuration of energy that now the specific divinities can operate through. If he fashioned the sun a fiery form, then now the fiery spirits of the divinities, those fiery divinities, they can operate in the physical world through that fiery form. When he fashioned the oceans, then now the deities with that cool energy, now they have a shrine in the world that they can invest their spirit in and operate through. He fashions the landmass of earth like a mountain, then the energies who have that kind of stable energy, magnetic type energy, now they can take up residence in that form because it's according to their nature. So this is why the text says um, he gave birth to the deities, he made the town, he established the gnomes. He placed the gods in their shrines. He settled their offerings. He established their shrines. He made their bodies according to their wishes. Thus the deities entered into their bodies of every wood, every stone, every clay, and so forth, everything that grows upon him in which they came to be. They were, thus were gathered to him all the deities and their cows, tent united with the Lord of the two lands. So not only did he take the life force energy of Ron Riot, he fashions it into specific forms. So now Ron Riot will give the Ba, and the Ba has the life energy of a spirit to them, but then Pata will give the specific form. So he fashions the ocean, those cool watery, you know, cool energy, magnetic type forces, they can take up residence there. He fashions different forms, they can take up residence in there. That's the physical shrines of the deities, like on Earth, in a cave region, a certain kind of cool energy manifests. The deity who has that kind of energy, he can take up residence there, and that's a natural shrine that we can go to and communicate with that divinity. In a mountainous region, the divinity that govern that kind of re that kind of energy, then they can take up residence in a sacred mountain. That's a natural shrine for that divinity on Earth go to a region where the sun is beating down and you can have direct connection with the sun, that's a region and it fires up the earth in that region, that's a natural shrine for a solar divinity on earth that we can go to that region and connect with that solar divinity in that region. There's a certain river kind of energy that moves through that, that shrine, that, that river becomes a shrine for that specific divinity. We can go to that divinity and at that natural shrine on earth and communicate with them. Then it says, he made their bodies according to their wishes, that's on earth, thus the deities entered into their bodies. Then entered into every wood, every stone, every clay, and so forth. So now we're talking about shrines that we fashion. If we fashion a sculpture, an idol, which is a divine process, so the idiots trying to tell us idolatry is evil, idolatry is divine, because the whites and their offspring are inferior to us, they can't fashion a sculpture directed by the deity Ptah. We can attune to the deity Ptah just like he fashioned the earth and fashioned the land masses and fashioned the core of earth and fashioned the oceans and fashioned the mountains and so forth, and the deities can take up residence in it because he understood the blueprint on how to fashion them so their energy was in harmony with that, that feature, that geological feature. He directs us how to fashion specific sculptures according to the quote-unquote desires of the deities, as it says in the text, meaning their specifications. They're like, if you fashion a sculpture in this specific form, then it will resonate at our frequency and we will take up residence in that form. And when you put that sculpture on your shrine and pull libation, we will come and take up residence in that form and communicate directly with you. It's no different than a cell phone. It's a specific form, and once you attune it and align it, then that energy will come through the cell phone and then you can communicate through the cell phone to somebody thousands of miles away. We are fashioning idols in Sesso based on the dictates and specifications of the Abosom, of the Orisha, of the Vodou, according to the functions and blueprint of Atah. And he shows us how to do that. And when we do that in harmony, then those specific divinities will take up residence in those sculptures and communicate directly with, with us when we give their offering. And it says he established their offering. What are the offerings? What specific form of offerings 
resonate at the frequency of those of envy. What plant life, what animal life, what mineral life serve as offerings or resonate at the frequency of that divinity? He established that. He gave the specifications of the blueprint and cataloged all the energies of the planet Earth, plant life, animal life, mineral life, and Afrodakani, Afrodakani, human life. We can go to that catalog or blueprint given by Pata, learn from that, and give the proper offerings because he established that. He printed that, imprinted it upon creation. So, again, when we talked about shrines, for example, we build a shrine. And we talked about the notion of magnification. So if you have a if sunlight is shining, it's a hot day, you have some leaves on the ground, some dry leaves, the sun is shining on the dry leaves on the ground, the leaves are just warm. If you take a magnifying glass and direct the sunlight through the magnifying glass over the leaves in a certain fashion, then the same sunlight that's been shining all day will shine through that glass. It becomes magnified, and now the leaves will catch on fire. When we establish shrines, specific forms, specific matrices, according to the blueprint given to us by Pata, then those shrines become magnifying devices. So the energy of the abosom that's in the atmosphere, in the oceans, and so forth, they get magnified through the shrine. It becomes like the magnifying glass. Their energy becomes intense at that shrine, and then we can communicate directly with them. So that's, that's what we're talking about here. And this is what Pata does. And he does that throughout the created universe. So every aspect of the created universe is a shrine for various abosom established by Pata. We can go to them and communicate with the abosom because of what Pata did and fashion those shrines, natural shrines, harmoniously. But then when we attune to him on our own, within our homes and in our regions, we can establish our own shrines just like he did. We can establish those shrines by learning directly from that divinity so that we can communicate with them as well as the Ntamafo as well. And then within our bodies, spiritually, we can fashion thought forms, which are shrines, that magnify the power of the Abosom if we're doing it properly. And that magnification, again, generates an electromagnetic field that draws us and influences our sum sum, our spirits, to align with that thought form we just created. If the thought form is, a, is directed by Pata, it's the kind of magnetic pull towards harmonious behavior, and that's what we want to engage in. Okay, so um, hold on one second. Just want to go through real quick, make sure I didn't miss anything. All right. All right, I want to look at the the ending of that text. Um, this, and this is where, again, they restate at the ending of the Shabaka text, they restate the piece about Asar and the piece at the top dealing with Asar because, again, because it was a grinding stone and people had destroyed it because grinding over hundreds of years and some of the sections of the text were ground out, but because it was restated at the bottom and those portions weren't ground out, we can tell what they were saying at the top of the text because it's a restatement of what was said. So it says, the great throne that gives joy to the heart of the deities in the house of Ptah is the granary of Tatanen, the mistress of all life, through which the sustenance of the two lands is provided, owing to the fact that Osar was drowned or submerged in his water. Oset and Nebuchadnezzar looked out, beheld him, and attended to him. Heru quickly commanded Oset and Nebuchadnezzar to grasp Osar and prevent his drowning or submerging they heeded in time and brought him to land. He entered the hidden portals in the glory of the lords of eternity, in the steps of him who rises in the horizon, on the ways of Ra, the great throne. He entered the palace and joined the deities of Tatanen and Ptah, lord of years. Thus, Osar came into the earth at the royal fortress to the north of the land to which he had come. His son Heru arose as king of Upper Kemet, rose as king of Lower Kemet in the embrace of his father Osar and of the deities in front of him and behind him. And of course, when you look at our publication, Kam Ur Kamet Orit, the um, enslavement and restoration of the Afurakani Afurakaitni Amenti in the West, 
um, we talk about the king being the summation of the people, the representative of the people. Tom Orr, or the great black one, um, Al-Sar being representative of the great black nation. Um, so when the great black one is thrown into a coffin and covered up by the red one and his followers and thrown into the water, and then water, it sails in the water and is eventually picked up and then opened up, and then the red one finds the body of the black one, carves the body up, and scatters it all over the place while the red one is in control. That's talking about the followers, the quote-unquote reddish, ruddy ones, and it's not the set is the whites in our spring, but those who pretended to follow set, the Arab type, the desert, Arabs in the desert, the nomads and so forth, claiming to take on set as their deity, but of course he wasn't having anything to do with them, but they are the reddish, white-skinned individuals who attacked the black nation, put them in a coffin, slave ship, throw them in the water, it sells through the water, the red one catches them again, opens up the coffin, carves up the black body, scatters it everywhere, and so forth. That whole piece, talking, we, we associated that and showed that whole process dealing with the enslavement of our people being sent into the Western Hemisphere, into Amenti, which is the dead land, land of the setting sun. In ancient Kemet, Amenti means the West because it's the land of the setting sun. It's also the land where people die, but it's also a precursor to res resurrection. So the black, one is, the black nation is split up, carved up, scattered everywhere, but then eventually the pieces are pulled back together by Heru, Aset, and Nebethet. The pieces are pulled together. He's resurrected. He comes into his glory in the north and um, goes into the land following Ra and so forth. So, of course, those of us who reconnect with our ancestresses and ancestors, reconnect with the Abosong, then we get reconstituted here in the north, um, and then we begin to follow Ra into the horizon, and we return and reestablish culture. So we, we get into that um, in that particular document. Uh, the last piece, we just want to go over the Uben Shane, the specific section dealing with the idols, so we can get some more clarity on that. So the information about the cosmology and the provenance of Ptah in the Kuku Tuntun, the ancestral jurisdiction. This information about dealing with the nature of the idol and the fashioning of specific form and so forth, this is in the Uben Shane, the ancestral summit. So, of course, both of those books are on our Nhoma page um, on the website, and we posted that link. Um, and just so for those, we only have 15 minutes left in the broadcast. Um, if you want to stay on, we may not stay up. We may not need to go over, into, over time this time because we only have this one last piece, unless people have some questions. Uh, but if, if we do need to go a few minutes in overtime, in, in less than 15 minutes now, the live stream on the, you know, Internet will cut off, but the, on the phone line you'll still be able to hear. Uh, so you would have to call in if you want to continue to listen past 11 o'clock. You have about 14 minutes. The call-in number is 657 383 Three five. We have like fourteen minutes to call in. All right. So, um, so before we get into that, so the Uben Shane ancestral summons. That's we're going to read from that now. Um, the Kukutun Tum ancestral jurisdiction. That's where you get that information about Pata being the fashioner, um, thought forms, and everything else. Um, what we wanted to point out is that the soft cover versions, of course, are there. We have 13 books for the people who are new and some other people who are, you know, getting reacquainted. We have 13 books out now in soft cover. We have 18 books. They're all on the website. The e-book e versions are all free. The soft cover versions out of the 18, right now we have 13 in soft cover as well. So you can download all of them for free as, as e-books. But the soft cover versions, we have 13 of them. We have, of course, the Kukudun Tum, the ancestral jurisdiction, where we go into detail about cosmology, Amen, Amenet, Ron Riot, Kind and so forth. 
um, and the nature of the soul, divine consciousness, the divinities and ancestral spirits, their relationship to us, and our true story. But then we also get into details proving that Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Moses, Aaron, Solomon, Sheba, Menelik, David, um, Jesus, Yeshua, Ben Pandera, Muhammad, Buddha, um, all of those characters are fictional characters who never existed at all of any race whatsoever or in any form whatsoever, including Yahweh and Allah and Brahman and so forth. And by the way, Ptah, when we're talking about Ptah in that text, in the Kukutun tomb, we also show that Ptah was corrupted into Buddha and the whole story of Buddha, Buddha is a fictional character. There was no black Buddha. There was no white Buddha. There was no Buddha, period. That whole story is taken from Ptah. The cosmology associated with Buddha is a corruption of fragments of our culture. That's why it's misinformation. So when you look at the philosophy, you see minor things that they took from our culture, but the majority of it is misinformation, fundamental misinformation. So, and we get into that in the Kuku Tun Tun. Um, so we go into detail showing those characters never existed, as well as our true story. Um, that's Kuku Tun Tun. We have Apuraka Apurakai, the origin of the term Africa. We're the first to show that Africa comes from Apuraka and show it in the Medutu and the hieroglyphics. Um, we have Maranechi, Divine Law and Divine Hate. We have this book, the Uben Shang Ancestral Summons, dealing with ritual practices and their functionality and what they are, you know, what, the nature of these ritual practices we engage in, libation and shrines and ritual song, ritual dance, ritual prayer, the various things that we engage in. Um, we have onk, the origin of the term yoga, karakasa, the origin and nature of the chakra. So we prove that onk and yoga, yoga, the term yonk, or yoga was corrupted into, from the term onk. The term karakra from ancient Kemet was corrupted into kakra or chakra in India. Um, we're going into detail about the nature of those practices and what they really are and what they're really not. We also, we added, just this weekend, we revised and added a piece to that book, just a couple of pages. Um, we had had an article before talking about Ab, the heart, and Kepra and Keprit, and what is considered Tai Chi and Qigong. Um, we showed in the Medusa the various basic movements that you will find um, that they call Tai Chi and Qigong is actually in the Medutu point by point. And then we showed the association of that with Ab and the heart and Kepra and Kepri, the female divinity Kepri, male divinity Kepra and so forth. We had that as an article, as a note on Facebook. Um, we decided to add that as an appendix to the Ankh, the origin of the term yoga and Karakasa, the origin and nature of the chakra. So if you look at the um, when, you, when you order that book, you'll see that we added that. We just added that Sunday. Um, so it's just an extra couple of pages. Um, so we did that. We also have the book Anidaho, Awareness. We talk about the origin of the term God, which is actually a title of Amen and Aminet. So when people say God is a German term and a proto-Germanic term and all that, they don't know what they're talking about. It direct, can be found directly Gan or Gan Gan, doubled. Ganga Ur, the title of Amen and Amenet, talking about the great Ganga or the great Gan. We go into detail about that. We also show that the origins of the term Negus and Naga and Negro and all of that, uh, Netra and so forth. We show that uh, the term Netra and Naga and Negus and Ganga Ur and so forth, none of them are the origin of the term Nigger which a lot of people are trying to make nigger, naga, and trying to make it sacred and divine and meaning the sacred black God, which is pure idiocy. So we, we prove that. Um, we have Koko Ball, which means warning, a series of articles collected in one volume talking about the fact that this sexuality, homosexuality, never existed in ancient Kemet, was never accepted in ancient Kemet, Various texts that the White Narrow Spring try to use to prove that homosexuality is part of our culture, we show clearly and we destroy those myths and we show um, conclusively that it's not accurate. And we examine those texts in detail to prove that. Um, so we have a number of books, um, so 13 altogether. 
the soft cover versions range between eight and eleven dollars. Um, so, and we also have a deal if you purchase the entire thirteen book set, um, it's thirty percent off. So basically, you get thirteen books, like a set of encyclopedias on ancestral culture and religion, thirteen books for eighty-six dollars. That's basically six dollars and sixty cents per book. So that's a permanent option, a permanent deal that we made. We also have the, if you have a 10 book set, any 10 books is 30% off as well. So it's basically, instead of $96 for 10 books, it's $66 for 10 books. So it's basically, again, $6.60 per book. So if you order any 10 book set of 10 books, it'll be um, $66, which is 30% off. Or if you order the entire 13 book set, is um, 86, which is 30% off as well. Normally it would be 123, but it's 86 for 13 books. Everybody who has received the 13 book set has been appreciative of not only the content of information, the detailed information, cosmologically and otherwise. And we print in full color on our own printers and in house. Um, so they appreciate the quality of the, of the publications as well as the content. Also, this, um, your support of these books, of course, assists us to continue to not only provide the ebook versions for free, which we're always going to do, but we also give away free copies of some of our texts when we do a presentation. When we do presentations in different cities, we give away one of our books to everybody who attends. We've given away over 350 books. Sometimes when people are being turned on to new information, never been involved in anything traditional, been taught that African culture is demonic and all this other nonsense. We don't charge for presentation. We don't charge when we do a presentation in a different city. We don't charge an admissions fee. It's free to our community. And then when people come, they're getting introduced to ancestral wisdom, reintroduced. It's free. And when they leave, they get a free book. Well, they get a free book as soon as they come in. So even if they didn't have the funds to purchase, we shouldn't be holding the information ransom, we should be able to give it to our people. And if they, you know, see, once they see it and study it, they'll see the value in it, they may come back and purchase another book when they're looking for additional information. We also have the option, so when you purchase the books that assist us to continue giving, doing free presentations, giving our free services, providing those, which includes substance abuse, abstinence, and domestic um, violence, overcoming that. These are free services, um, and we also and going to different cities doing presentations and, and helping to establish and reestablish culture. We don't charge organizers, you know, speakers fees to come out and speak. We don't charge people thousands of dollars or hundreds of dollars to speak. We don't charge people at all. There's no speakers fee involved, and then there's no admissions fee. And in order for us to continue to do that, we need support with our books. So if you make a purchase, whether it's one book or more, that's always a support. And we, um, we have the option of people, sometimes people make a donation, and you can do that on the on home on page as well. If you make a $15 donation or more, we're going to send you a book anyway. And some people, if you make a, some people have made the option of doing a recurrent donation, which you can click that on the donation section in PayPal. Like, for example, people make a $15 concurrent, recurrent donation. They're automatically basically donating, you know, once a month on the same date. And what we'll do is we will um, send you a book, you know, um, every, every month on the same day. So we have 13 books out now. So at least for the next 13 months, you'll get a book every month on the same day. Um, within a few weeks, we're going to have more books out that we're working on, so within a few months we'll probably have at least 20 books out. So we'll always have enough. Even if somebody made a $30 donation, we could send you two books a month for right now for the next six months. Um, by the time six months is up, we'll have a, a number more books out. So we'll, we'll be able to, by the time those months are up, we'll have enough to send you two books a month for the next, you know, year, really. So, again, um, Okay, hold on one second. We saw a little message there. Okay, made I say we appreciate that. And that's one individual who ordered the books as well. So, um, so yeah, so going to the 
Clinton Home Office page, the publications page on OG.po.com, O-D-W, I-R-A, F is in free, O.com. Going to the Nhoma publications page, you can do that tonight. We appreciate it. Yet I say we thank you for that. Um, and also you can contact us through the contact us section on the website. Um, we are working on our schedule for this you know, next couple of months up until the winter solstice um, for where we're going to be traveling to um, during the summer between June 22nd and September 22nd. We had, you know, we went to a number of different states. We went to, you know, Baltimore, and we went to Connecticut, and we went to um, Virginia. We went to a number of different places during presentations. Um, then in September, uh, we had our seven-day New Year celebration. We didn't do any broadcast during that time. Of course, we didn't travel during that time. Um, and now we're getting back into, you know, our schedule for the next, cycle up until December 20, 20th, 21st, when the solstice is, um, which we'll take another break there as well. So if you want us to come to your region, just go to our website, contact us, and so forth. You can check out the books as well and see what you want us to present on. We have 13 or 18 books, we have 60 articles as well. We have a number of videos, about 49 videos, most of them about two hours each. Um, and then we also have, to date, we have 42 broadcasts. This will be 43rd, most of them between two and three hours. Um, so you can download all the archives from that as well. So whatever you want us to present on, then just let us know. Email us, let us know, and then we can work out something where we can come to your region. We present to study groups as well as large groups as well. So just hit us up with that. Um, and you can also um, hit us up on 202 717 Zero zero five zero. All right, so let's just go through the last piece, which is the Ubin Shang, the piece um, in the second section, the very first piece in the second section. The second section is under the rubric of Mesura and Odomankuma, and it's titled God is an Idolater. Of course, the Ubin Shang is information we got from our Nananoman Samafo ancestresses and ancestors that they wanted us to, you know, write about. So we, we wrote about and got the direction directly from them. Um, and so it's a series of like one page essays of information that our Samafo wanted to get out. And they gave us the specifics about it and the specific examples. And we go here, we're talking about God. In this sense, we're talking about the God, Pata. When it talks about goddess here, we're talking about the goddess Sechima in this particular piece. That's why when it says God is an idolater, we're talking about Pata. So these are the words of the Nananoman Samafo that we just, you know, wrote out and made sure we got it right, published it. So it says God is an idolater, that's the title. An idol is substance structured into a specified form according to a pre existent image. Is the sun idolized fire? It is not the creative power, but a vehicle through which that active and aggressive phase of creative power can manifest itself on the physical plane. Is the ocean idolized water? It is not the creative power, but a vehicle through which that passive and receptive phase of creative power can manifest itself on the physical plane. Is the moon idol? Is the earth idol? Is the jackal? Lion, bear, serpent, idol. Is the hammer idol? Does it not take the place of creative, destructive force on the physical plane? What is the greatest idol? Are you an idol? Did goddess, meaning segment, not provide the substance, and god, meaning pata, not structure your form? Are you created according to an image born of the supreme being? Does god not worship you? Does he not worship you? You Does he not shift his word or his spirit, his power, his vibration, his breath into your very form while existing in essence as your form? In that sense, we're talking about Ra and Riot, shipping words or shipping vibrations into your form, word shipping. Okay, God is an idolater, talking about Pata, the great idolater. He creates idols daily. He idolizes perpetually. He idolizes you. 
goddess, meaning Sekhmet, spins the images, which will, will become physical reality. Then goddess, god, meaning Ra and Ra, 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 and Ra comes into being in the form of the things it created. You exist as idol, and spirit word shifts you until you learn to worship it, until you learn to send yourself to self to achieve union. Then you become the great idolater. Who of the creator, creator's idols now comes to destroy idolatry? Will he destroy himself? Spirit releases creative power through a, the filter of a time-conditioned reality. Each phase of power generating a geometric pattern in space. Each pattern holding the key, the vibrations of the phase of creative power which created it. If you are of God, if you are of goddess, then you have the right and the responsibility to idolize. Your idolatry is creative process. You are fashioning a form after the design of a pre-existing pattern leads you to true worship. To ship, send a word is to ship or send your worth. Your worth is your value. Your value is expressed mathematically as the sum total of the vibrations who you, whose unique key ratio of waves and rates manifest on the physical plane as your spirit body. True worth or wordship turns the key, releases the vibration of the cosmic pattern. As every key is, un, is turned, every power is unleashed, at one minute comes you transit to transcend time. So what we're talking about here is, the, for example, the term worship is talking about word shipping, or shipping or sending words. Words are collections of sound vibration. So when you're word shipping, you're sending sound vibration. That's what word ship means, to send or to ship words or sound vibration. The word, word as well as the term worth, are from the same root. Worth is value. What is your value? You're a configuration of energy. Fire energy, water, and every, everything else, just like everybody else is, but your configuration of those forces is unique to you, just like the configuration of somebody else's is unique to them. Somebody else may have, they have fire in their system, they have water in their system. Some people may have more fire than you do, and a little bit less water, so they're a more fiery person. You may be more watery than them, more receptive and cool than them, but you have some fire as well or you wouldn't be alive. So your ratio from fire to water is different from theirs. If you look at the various elements, we're made of those, of those various elements, but the configuration of those elements is what's unique, which, you know, defines us. The configuration of those various elements that's unique to us is our value, and it can be expressed mathematically as the collection of vibrations of the unique waves and rates that make up our configuration. That's our value. And, you know, what emanates from us, the collection of vibrations that emanates from your form, is different than anybody else's because nobody else has the exact same form that you do. If you blow air through a trumpet and blow air through a tuba, it's the same air coming from the same set of lungs because the form is different. The sound vibrations that come out will be different. The same life force energy from rod and riot that moves through your form also moves through somebody else's form, another Apurakani or Apuraikaitni person's form. Because your forms are different, the collection of sound vibrations emanating from you as an instrument is different from the sound vibrations emanating from that other person. It's also an instrument. The collection of sound vibrations that emanate from you collectively is your value. It's your worth. It's a collection of energy, and it can be expressed mathematically, but that's your value. That's your worth. So when you speak, when you act, when you talk about your heart and your tongue uniting and speaking, and you generate ideas and desires, and then you begin to move in creation, and as you move, you emit energy, that's you're projecting your energy, you're emanating energy. Energy is exuding from you. When you decide to ship your energy ritually, you send, you engage in ritual prayer, ritual song, ritual dance, and you project energy from yourself and project it out to a divinity, you are shipping the energy of your own spirit to that force in creation. That's word shipping or worth shipping or 
energy vibrations, you're shipping them. That's word shipping. That's what we're talking about. When Batah fashions the world, fashions the earth, fashions the mountains, fashions and so forth, an idol is a substance structured into a specific form according to a preexistent image or pattern. That's what an idol is. So the sun is an idol, the earth is an idol, the mountains is an idol, plant life, animal life, mineral life, bears, serpents, Afurakani, Afurakani, people, human beings, our, just our people. We are made of substance, fashioned into a specific form after a preexistent pattern or image. The preexistent image or pattern is encoded within our crop, and then because Pata knows what that image is that was given by Inyame Wa Inyame or Boade, he fashions us according to that preexistent pattern that's encoded within our souls. So everything that's a substance according to a, you know, structured into a specific form according to a preexistent pattern and image is an idol. So we're all idols, first of all. So anybody saying there's something wrong with an idol, then that means they're saying something wrong with everything that exists that was created by the Supreme Being because everything is an idol. Literally. Now, what about worshiping idols? Does Ra and Ra'et, the creator and creatress, the great spirit that animates all created entities, the life force energy that they send through all created entities, they're sending their energy, they're shipping their energy, they're shipping their words or collection of sound vibrations as they move through creation through their <clears throat> idols. So they're engaged in idol word-shipping or worshipping. If the supreme being directs Ra and Ra at the creator and creatress to direct Pata to fashion idols, and once the idols are fashioned, Ra and Ra's energy moves through the idols to enliven them, then idolatry is divine. And if the creator and creatress, our great-grandparents, engage that process on a daily basis, then we engage in that same process because our culture is a reflection of the culture of the Supreme Being. As above, so below. What the Supreme Being does, that's what we do. So we can fashion an idol as well, and the divinities will take up residence in that idol, and we can communicate directly with it just like you do with a cell phone. So that's what idol worshipping is. That's dangerous the whites and their offspring, because when they invade a country and they wage war and kill as many people as possible, and then they establish a new rule over the population, if somebody can go into their home and establish a little wooden sculpture, and the deity takes up residence in the wooden sculpture and says, go and kill the whites and their offspring, they're your enemies, you can't control the population who will establish a little sculpture, and the sculptures are telling them to go to kill the white man. If the people can teach you that God is a white man, and if you think about attacking anybody and think about anything other than turning the other cheek, then you're evil and you're going to burn in hell, then you should never think about revenge and retaliation and hate is evil and the devil's going to, you know, destroy you for doing that and that's all this other nonsense, then you, you'll be easily controlled. But if you've been taught that for years, and then one day somebody teaches you, actually, you can set up an idol. And you go and set up an idol and worship an idol, and the spirit comes and says, hey, Jesus never existed. Go get some guns, go get some weapons, and massacre these Achiwarifa. They can't stop that. They can't determine when an Abosom is going to tell you to get up one day and massacre them. That's too dangerous. So they had to teach that idolatry is evil because they can't control when you're going to go get a piece of wood, when you're going to get a piece of metal, when you're going to get a stone, when you're going to engage in ritual practice, and when these Abosom and Insamaf are going to come forward and tell you and direct you not only to wipe out the whites and their offspring, but how to wipe them out, tell you how to go in the forest, develop, uh, you know, minerals, plant life, chemical and biological warfare, and release that amongst the population. They can't control that, so the best they can do is make you believe it's evil to even think about engaging that process or make you think that it's superstitious and foolish and primitive and you're too embarrassed to even engage the process. Because once you actually engage the process, 
you will realize how open, wide open it is for us to engage all kinds of processes that will lead to the destruction of our enemy. So that's why they had to teach that idolatry is evil, wrong, and all this other nonsense. But it's also key to the way we exist in the world. For top fashions, everything has a specific form. So everything is an idol, quote-unquote, and idolatry, quote-unquote, is what makes the world literally go around. As Ra and Riot, the creator and creatress's energy is moving throughout all of creation. They're moving throughout these fashion, specifically fashion forms, and idolatry is happening all the time. So we have to re-establish and reconnect with our actual culture. All the things that the White Snarl Spring said was evil and wrong. You will find that they're actually in harmony with order. And the only thing that's evil and wrong is the White Snarl Spring and their culture and their fake religion. So we need to understand that. So um, if there are no questions, then we're going to uh, end it right here. just want to check the phone lines real quick. Um, make sure we didn't have any statements online in the piece. Okay, and the brother logged out. That, that was one brother who he left a message thanking us for the show, um, saying he was going to send a donation next week. But he was one of the people who ordered the, um, at the time, the 10 book set. Before we had the 13 books out, we had the 10 books out, ordered the 13 book set. And once he got the 13 book, oh, I'm sorry, the 10 book set. He was really impressed with that. He really appreciated it. He, he put some images online showing the um, copies of the books once he received them and, and posted them on Facebook. We had a couple of people do that. Once they got the books in the mail, they took photos like on Instagram and sent them on Facebook to show people what they had gotten. And, and you know, they really appreciate the information. So all the things we're talking about here and on the videos and, you know, of course, the books and everything, um, that information is encoded with those, in those books. And, um, again, when you support our soft cover public, publications, it allows us to continue to do the work that we're doing, whether it's through the broadcast, through the presentation, through the services that we have, um, rights of passage, and everything else that we do. So we appreciate um, you tuning in. Yidase, we thank you. Um, tomorrow we'll be back on Ojira. We're going to send out a notification for that. And we're going to confirm who's going to be the guest on the Wednesday show at Gua Marketplace, and we'll be sending out a notification for that as well. So, Yerase, we thank you, and we will connect with you tomorrow. Yebeshiyah.